It's April 14th, 2015, and this is your 40 and Slip Science News from RT.com. Doctors seem to be a step closer to performing a breakthrough surgery, transplanting a human head onto another body. A Russian man with a rare genetic muscle wasting disorder has volunteered to be the first to try the procedure. I'm very interested in technology and anything progressive that might change people's lives for the better, Valery Spiridonov from the Russian city of Vladimir told RT. Spiridonov, a 30-year-old qualified computer scientist, works for an IT firm. He said that his disease is getting worse every year, and usually people with wernig hoffman disorder, a disease that wastes muscles, don't live longer than 20 years, so it would be a chance to prolong his life and help scientific research in the process. Doing this isn't only an excellent opportunity for me, but will also create a scientific basis for future generations, no matter what the actual outcome of the surgery is, he said. The operation is set to be conducted by renowned Italian surgeon Sergio Canavero, who sees the procedure as comparable to space exploration. Russia sent Yuri Gagarin into space with fair chances of dying. America sent Neil Armstrong to the moon with fair chances of dying. And the chances here are much, much better, Canavero told RT. According to Canavero, the operation is set to last up to 36 hours and will cost over 11 million. During the procedure, the patient's brain will be cooled down to 10 to 15 degrees Celsius, 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, to prolong the time the cells are able to survive without oxygen. The body will be taken from a brain dead but otherwise healthy donor. An ultra sharp scalpel will be used to cut through the spinal cord and a special biological glue will be used to connect the head to the new body. After the operation, Valeri will be put into a coma for three to four weeks to prevent any movement. He will also be given immunosuppressants with the aim of preventing the body rejecting its new head. Many medics are against carrying out the procedure, with a Californian doctor saying it is too overwhelming a project to succeed, while others branded it too outlandish to consider and simply crazy. From BBC.com, a 90% complete terror bird skeleton found on an Argentinian beach suggests these big beak predators had good low frequency hearing and deep voices. It is the most complete skeleton ever discovered for one of these menacing beasts and represents a new species. Scientists have even been able to reconstruct the shape of its inner ear. This offers clues about the animal's hearing, which was probably lower than that of modern birds and suggests they use low pitched calls to communicate. Argentinian paleontologists made the discovery in the cliffs of La Estafeta Beach, not far from the popular tourist city of Mar de Plata. Federico de Grange, one of the study's authors, said dealing with the tide had presented a challenge. The sea can actually take the fossil and destroy it in the sea. It's a nice place to work, but you have to be fast, he told BBC News. Terror birds were the top predators on the South American landmass in the era following the dinosaur's extinction some 65 million years ago. The flightless beast stood up to 3 meters tall, boasting long legs and devastating hooked beaks. A previous study of this weaponry suggests that the birds could have dispatched their prey with a single blow before setting to work on its flesh. They evolved very unique forms with huge skulls, huge beaks with hooks, and long hind limbs, said Dr. DeGrange, a terror bird specialist who works at the National University of Cordoba. They lost their ability to fly and they developed very unusual predatory capabilities that were not present in any comparable animals. It stood about 1.2 meters tall and probably weighed 18 kilograms, making it a medium-sized addition to the terror bird family. And it lived towards the end of that family's long period of dominance, some 3.5 million years ago. This means it probably ate mammals or other birds, pretty much anything smaller than itself, Dr. DeGrange suggested. Perhaps the most intriguing among the well-preserved details of the fossil is its skull, which allowed the researchers to make some educated guesses about the animal's sensory capabilities, and even its voice. A very interesting thing is that we could reconstruct the shape of the inner ear, Dr. DeGrange said. Based on comparisons with living species, these measurements suggested that the ears of terror birds were most sensitive to low-pitched sounds. We are able to say that terror birds had low-frequency sensitivity, so it seems reasonable to suggest that they also produced low-frequency sounds. Again, by comparing their anatomy with birds that are alive today, you might imagine they sounded something like an ostrich or an emu, Dr. DeGrange said. But it's impossible to say for sure. Also from the BBC.com, NASA's Curiosity rover has found that water can exist as a liquid near the Martian surface. Mars should be too cold to support liquid water at the surface, but salts in the soil lower its freezing point, allowing briny films to form. The results lend credence to a theory that dark streaks seen on features such as crater walls could be formed by flowing water. Scientists think thin films of water form when the salts in the soil absorb water from the atmosphere. 
The temperature of these liquid films is about minus 70 degrees Celsius, too cold to support any of the microbial life forms that we know about. Forming in the top 15 centimeters of the Martian soil, the brines would also be exposed to high levels of cosmic radiation, another challenge to life. But it's still possible that organisms could exist somewhere beneath the surface on Mars where conditions are more favorable. The researchers drew together different lines of evidence collected over a Martian year and from different instruments carried by the Curiosity rover. The rover environmental monitoring system, essentially the vehicle's weather station, measured the relative humidity and temperature at the rover's landing site of Gale Crater. Scientists were also able to estimate the subsurface water content using data from an instrument called Dynamic Albedo of Neutrons. This data was consistent with water in the soil being bound to salt. Finally, the sample analysis at Mars instrument gave the researchers content of water vapor in the atmosphere. The results show conditions were right for the brines to form during winter nights at the Martian equator where Curiosity landed, but the liquid evaporates during the Martian day when temperatures rise. Javier Martin Torres, a co-investigator on the Curiosity mission and lead scientist on REMS, told BBC News the detection was indirect but convincing. They were not seeing the planets, but they were able to see the gravitational effects on the star. It's speculation at this point, but these observations at least support or go in this direction, said Dr. Martin Torres.